First of all, I'd like to welcome all of you to our message series entitled, We Are Family. And from today up to March 29, we are going to look at different topics related to the family. And this is in line with our church's theme of Disciple the Family, Impact the Nations. A moment ago, Elder Ernie prayed that uh, something about perfect family, that there is no such thing. And it's true, there is no such thing as perfect families. But there is, a, there is such a thing as redeemed families, families that uh, where everyone follows Jesus Christ, loves Jesus Christ, and who can live the redeemed life, who can demonstrate through their lives what it means to follow the Lord and Master. We all know that God values the family very much. He values both the literal family as well as the spiritual family, the church. And if God values family highly, we as His people, as the church, should do no less. And so our prayer for this series is that it will bless you all. It will strengthen your family relationships. And as a result of doing so, we will bring glory to God. There's an interesting and exciting event in track and field. It is called the Relay. In the Olympics, as well as in the international track and field competitions, you will find relay events like the 4x100 relay, where you will find each country represented by four runners. Each runner must run for 100 meters, uh, holding in his hand one baton. And then he must pass on the baton to the next runner. And the second runner will run the same distance, 100 meters, and then he has to pass it on to the third runner. And then the third runner passes it to the fourth runner, and the fourth runner must run all the way to the finish line. Now, it's not an easy event to participate in. You think it's just running. No. There, there is some mastery to it. And very often, there are techniques involved in running the, uh, the relay. Like, the first runner will probably run on what we call as the inside track. Then the second runner is slightly leaning towards the left, so that the first runner holds the baton in his left hand, the second runner must reach out with his right, and then they will alternate. Okay. So there's, there are techniques involved in running the relay. And very often in, very, in international events, the second, the third, and the fourth runners do not look back but instead they are given instructions by a coach who tells them to start running. And when they start running, what they do is they just simply reach out their hand in anticipation of the baton. Now, if they drop the baton, we all know that the entire team is disqualified. The same way, if the transfer of the baton takes place outside of what is known as the safe area or the designated area of transfer, the team is also disqualified. You see, usually the person who holds the baton at, at one stage, before he passes it, the next runner begins to run a bit. But he has to run within a certain boundary. If he goes beyond that boundary and then receives the baton, then the entire team is also disqualified. Uh, this was what happened in the 2013 uh, World Track and Field Championships. The British team, uh, they were supposed to have won the bronze medal, but they were disqualified because they exchanged the baton outside the designated area. And so what happened was that the fourth place team, the Canadian team, they automatically became the third placers. Now passing on the fate to the next generation can be likened to the passing of the baton in a relay race. If we don't pass uh, the baton or pass our faith to our children, then it is like dropping the baton like this. Okay, the U.S. team, they drop the baton in the Beijing Olympics. Okay. So if you don't pass the faith to your children, it's just like that. You drop the baton. Now, if we try passing the faith at a stage where they become resistant to the gospel, 
then it's like attempting to transfer the baton outside the designated area. And we do not want both of these scenarios to happen. And so as we kick off these messages on the family, it's important that we talk about how we can pass the faith to the next generation. In America today, according to many articles that I've been reading, young people are dropping out of churches in great number. Usually those who reach uh, junior high, college, they will drop out of church. But thankfully, there's a number that will come back. But they will come back once they're in their 30s. Okay? But still, a good number will depart the church and never come back. And then in Western Europe, very few people attend church services anymore. And this is forcing many congregations to either merge with others or to close down the church completely. This is an example. This is in Arnhem, Netherlands. Uh, a cathedral has become a place where they can do skateboarding. Because uh, back then, cathedrals are quite huge, something like this, or even bigger. And you could put up you know, ramps where you could uh, do skateboarding. Can you believe that? Can you believe one day it happens here? Or another church in Edinburgh, Germany becomes a bar, and not just some ordinary bar, it's a bar with a horror theme, Frankenstein. Can you believe that? A church building becomes a bar with a theme of Frankenstein or you know a horror show. Now, there are many reasons cited for the decline of Christianity in these nations. But my personal conviction is that the decline is primarily caused by parents, as well as by followers of Jesus Christ, who have failed to pass the faith to the next generation. Yes, we can blame uh, our secular society. We can blame uh, the music that we listen to, the media, all of that. But the bottom line is, it is we as parents or as spiritual parents, we have failed the next generation. And that is why the next generation departs from the faith. This morning, I'd like to invite everyone to reflect on a passage that I'm sure we have heard many times uh, being expounded here. And it's a pet, uh, passage about parents faithfully passing on the faith to the next generation. And it's a passage that's very much applicable in our time. And it goes beyond just the relationship in a literal family to include the relationship in the spiritual realm, the, in the spiritual family in the church. And so we're going to look at the passage Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. I'd like to begin by talking a bit about the context of Deuteronomy. Now the book of Deuteronomy covers the period when a younger generation of Israelites were about to enter the Promised Land. You see, the previous generation had already died out in the wilderness uh, as punishment for their refusal to enter the Promised Land. If you remember in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, uh, when the 12 spies entered the Promised Land, when they came back, uh, 10 of them gave what was known as a negative assessment. They were saying that the people there are big. Okay? We are like grasshoppers. We will not be able to win against them. And virtually everyone excited with the pen. And so what happened was that God said that this generation will not enter into the promised land. Those who are 20 years old and up. And so they wandered around the desert or around the wilderness for an additional 38 years. And so this new generation that's about to enter in, probably the oldest other than Joshua and Caleb, was probably around 57 or 58 years old. That was the oldest person of that generation. And so uh, these people, they were about to enter the promised land. And they need to be reminded again of who the Lord was and what He had done for them. You see, this generation that was about to enter in, not all of them 
probably recall uh, crossing the Red Sea. Not many among them probably recalled about the ten plagues and how God delivered them from Egypt. And then they also need to be reminded of the commands of God because the first time that God gave His commandments was, if you remember, in Mount Sinai, in that area. And so this new generation, they probably never heard it being taught again. And so they needed to be reminded that this is what God has commanded. And so Moses spent considerable time teaching this younger generation about the law. And that's why the title Deuteronomy, it actually means the second law. Not because it is a new set of laws, but rather it means it is a copy, it is a second, uh, sort of a second reminder for the people of Israel. And in today's passage, we find Moses instructing the young generation of Israelites with regards to passing on what they have learned to the next generation. And from this passage, there are at least three lessons that I was able to glean from it. The first lesson that we can glean is that we must be rightly connected with God first before we can disciple the next generation. Okay? We must be rightly connected with God before we can disciple the next generation. I want you to look closely at these verses. This is verses 1 and 2. Uh, we're reading from the ESV. And here it says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over, to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God. You and your son, and your son's son, by keeping all the statutes and his commandments which I command you. Did you notice how many times you keeps on occurring in these two verses? In that passage, okay, Moses was telling his audience, that particular generation, he was telling them, you must take the lead in obeying God's command. You must respect the authority of God as your king and ruler. And it is when they know how to fear the Lord and obey the Lord, then they can effectively disciple the next generation. That was what God was telling the people. Before you can even disciple your children or disciple uh, your spiritual children, you have to, first of all, be rightly connected with God. You have to be connected to Him in faith. You have to be connected to Him in the sense of following Him, obeying Him. Look at verse 5. We're familiar with verse 5. It says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and with all your mind. Again, the emphasis is on that particular generation who the one that was listening to Moses teach. And notice further the word love. It says, you shall love the Lord. The word love okay, is not a shallow word. It's not like an emotional, merely an emotional word. Yesterday is Valentine's Day. Okay, and you know what people do on Valentine's Day. You know, get flowers, chocolates, teddy bears, and what have you. But that's a very shallow kind of love. Because when we talk about love, love is all about the idea of relationship. And so when, when this verse was mentioned, the idea was that you must have a relationship with God. And it is when people have a right relationship with God, when they have God's word in their hearts, then they are able or qualified to teach the next generation. Someone once said, you cannot give away what you don't have. And as we talk about making disciples of the next generation or of our children, remember, you cannot pass on to them what you do not have in the first place. You cannot, you cannot tell them to have a relationship with God 
if you yourself do not have a relationship with Him. You cannot model the Christian life for them if you don't follow Jesus Christ in the first place. Uh, I remember hearing, this is something that's real, I heard non-Christian parents telling their children, oh, you should go to church. You should believe in the God of the Bible. And the reason is because they were impressed with how the church was helping their kids. Okay, this, this is something that happened here in our church. However, if you ask the parents themselves, they are unwilling to step inside the church. They tell their children, okay, go to church, it's good for you. It's good to believe in this Jesus that they talk about. But then they themselves do not step inside the church. They hesitate to accept the life-giving message of the gospel. Now, these parents are well-meaning. They are encouraging their children to love the Lord. And in a way, that's good. But the strange thing is that they don't want to enter into a relationship with Him. And that's strange. That's a contradiction. Also, these parents, okay, if their children become Christians, okay, and yes, they encourage them to become Christians, but they themselves do not become Christians, how can they disciple these kids? How can they help these kids in the way of the Lord since they don't know the Lord personally in the first place? And so Moses, he got it right when he told the people of Israel, fear the Lord, love the Lord, obey the Lord. Because how can you help the next generation know the Lord unless you yourself know the Lord? How can you tell the next generation, follow the Lord, if you yourself are not following the Lord? You know, let me say this. It is not the job of the Sunday school teacher. It is not the job even of the pastors. But rather, it is the job of the parents, whether it is the literal parents or the spiritual parents, to model for the next generation how to love the Lord, how to know the Lord, and how to follow the Lord. That is why we strongly emphasize here that we need to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Because a personal relationship with Jesus Christ not only brings salvation and new life, it also enables us to begin the journey of discipleship of following Jesus. And when we are disciples of Jesus Christ, when we are following Him, it prepares us to make disciples of our own children and of our next generation. And so we need to remember that even before we can disciple the next generation, we ourselves should first of all be connected to the Lord. Now, a second point that we find in the passage is that discipling the next generation requires giving quantity and quality time. When Moses instructed the Israelites with regards to teaching their children the ways of the Lord, he reiterated that, there had, that they had to be there for their children. Okay? They had to be present. For their children. They have to be physically, emotionally, and spiritually present for them. And in other words, they have to invest time in their kids. Look at verse 7. Here Moses told them to talk about God's word when. It says when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise or when you start the new day. And all these actions require that parents be present with their children. This meant that they were to grab moments when they could teach important lessons to their children. And this same principle actually applies today. If you want to disciple the next generation, or if you want to disciple your children, you need to be there 
for them. You must be willing to invest your time in teaching them. And you have to discern the moments when we can teach them something valuable or spiritual. I'm sure we've heard the arguments uh, some parents are making nowadays. They're saying, I'm so busy. And what they say next is, I cannot give quantity time to my kids, but I will make up for it by giving them quality time. Who among you have heard that? Okay. I've heard that. Okay. I can't give quantity time, but I will give quality time. Now, there are others who boast of their ability to give quantity time. But the truth is, we need to give the next generation not just quality time or quantity time, but we need to give them both quality time and quantity time if we want to disciple them properly. In a parenting website that I read, uh, here's what the, what the author said. She said, some parents think that they can give quality time without large quantities of time. But it is impossible to schedule quality time. Children share what's on their mind when it comes to mind, which is why quality moments typical, typically occur during quantity time. In addition, children experience many small events each day that have an impact on them. So parents who spend generous amounts of time with their children are best able to understand and address their fears, hesitations, and actions. And so the author here was saying that you cannot separate quality time from quantity time when you're dealing with young kids. But I think it doesn't just apply for young children. It applies with older children and it even applies for new believers. We need to spend sufficient time with them and make the most of those moments to teach and train them. However, be sure that quality time is used to, or rather your quantity of time is used to build your relations with the next generation. Because you know, you can be physically present, but you're not relating to your children. Maybe you are there for them physically, but you're not capturing every moment and making it a teachable moment for them. And so we need to remove the things that hinder us from having quality time. I'd like to cite an example that is uh, very rampant nowadays. Okay, you see it okay, every time you have dinner or lunch, whether at home or outside. Now during dinner, lunch time, or meal time, it's supposed to be a time where you talk to each other. It's supposed to be a time where you catch up on what's happening in, in uh, each person's life, right? It's a good time to talk about spiritual matters during meal time. But nowadays, what do we see during meal time? This is what we see. People bring out their cell phones, their devices, their tablets, they turn on their Wi-Fi's, they start browsing, okay. yes, they're physically present, okay. parents are physically present but their minds are not there, the kids are physically present but what are they doing, they're playing Minecraft or whatever games they're playing, okay. we see them plugging on their iPods or whatever music devices into their ears. They enter into the virtual world and then they ignore the people around them. And parents are just as guilty as the kids. You see, you can be present physically, like during a meal time, but you're not really there for the kids or for the people that you want to disciple. That's why one of the advice I would give to parents, especially to those who have young kids, okay, uh, don't allow them to take out their devices during mealtime. And even for parents, okay, 
you can, maybe you can lay aside your phones for a while and use those moments to get to know your kids better, to know what's happening in their lives. And it's the same with our disciples, those who we are mentoring. Okay. I think you can lay aside your devices for a while, for an hour, okay. and then take time to just relate with them, to know them, to talk with them. And so we need to redeem the time. And we have to make it something meaningful for the next generation by making the time that we need as teachable moments where we talk about the Lord, we talk about following Jesus Christ, we talk about living out the Word of God. We can redeem the time by teaching them and uh, about building God characters, about instilling Godly values to the everyday things that we are doing. And so discipleship of the next generation it requires an investment of time, both quality and quantity. Discipleship calls us also to be aware of the teachable moments. So as you spend quantity time with your children or with the next generation of believers, be sure that you also make it quality time. Let's make time for them so that we can teach them God's ways. And then the third and final lesson that we can learn from this passage is that we should be diligent in teaching the next generation. Uh, I like the way that ESV renders verse 7. Uh, in the NIV, it says, impress upon them. But in the ESV, it says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. Uh, the word diligence, according to the dictionary, is defined as the careful and persistent work or effort. And what this means for us is that we must teach our children with perseverance until they really understand the lesson that we're trying to drive at. In other words, you don't just say once or twice, but you keep on driving home the lesson until they get it. And then diligence also means being careful of what and how we teach. And so this is a call for us to be consistent in what we say and in what we do. And what this verse is telling us is that we must never give up when we teach the next generation. I know for many parents here, there will be times when your kids will be difficult to teach. I recall my, my own example, okay? When I was a child, okay, in my elementary years, I was not a very teachable kid when it comes to Chinese. Okay? I really resented learning Chinese. Okay? And I have received my share of the ruler okay, on my hands okay, from my mother. Okay. And so there will be times that your kids will be very difficult to teach. And I'm not just talking about academics. I'm talking about things like spiritual matters, things about character, things about godly values. The same is true also for some of the people that we're trying to disciple or we're trying to mentor. There will be moments that they will be stubborn and they will not be accepting of God's Word. They may be reluctant to change. But then we must not lead them to go their own way. But we must be patient. We must lovingly teach them and model for them what we're trying to convey to them. And so we have to persist and at the same time, we have to model it out for them. Uh, Christian psychologist and author Larry Crabb, uh, the author of books like Inside and Out, okay, uh, he told about the time when he was around four years old. And he was watching his father. Okay. His father was praying on a Sunday morning during the communion service. So as his father prayed, a thought entered his young mind, he would write. 
he sensed that his father was really talking to someone. There was no one there. Of course, when you're praying to God, you, there was no one, you know, visible in, the, uh, in that place. But he sensed his father was really talking to someone. And that this someone meant more to him than anyone else in that room. And so at four years old, he already had that impression from his father about prayer. And so it created this lasting impression on him. Now I'm sure that the father has taught him carefully how to pray. But then it was that one instance, one instance when he was praying, that Larry Crabb saw his father praying with love and passion towards God. And that gave him a very powerful model of prayer and a very powerful model of what it means to be a praying man. And so that is diligence. Okay, you can teach it, but then it's also important that you have to be careful with how you live. In other words, you have to model it properly. And so our diligence should be strongly manifested in our obedience to God's commands. And that is the point behind verses 8 and 9. In verses 8 and 9, it says, You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, as frontlets between your eyes, write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Now, when Moses told the Israelites to tie them as symbols on their hands and bind them on their foreheads, he was not actually telling them to take it literally. And so, it's not necessary for you to put, you know, a box, like uh, when we were in Israel, when you look at the Orthodox Jews, when they're praying, they have this, they have a box, and then they would have a sort of a leather strap around their hands, okay? That was not the point behind this passage. He was not telling them, okay, you have to literally put this on your head on your, or on your hands. He was not telling them to literally put a mezuzah, okay, on their door. And then, you know, every time you enter the house, you have to touch it and pray or remember God. No, that was not the point. But he was telling them, be constantly reminded as to the observance of the Lord's commands and actually do what is commanded. In other words, remind yourself constantly that you must obey the Lord. O obey the Lord in, his, in terms of His commandments. And so it is by our careful observance of the Lord's commands, of what the Bible teaches us, that the next generation will see our model. You see, when, when the next generation sees that we model the Christian life well, maybe not perfectly, but well, as inconsistent, then our teaching will be accepted. And so to all, all of us here, whether we are literal parents or spiritual parents, we must be persistent and careful in how we teach the next generation. We must be deliberate in teaching them and be conscious in modeling the Christian life for them. To conclude, we are commanded to pass the faith to the next generation. It may be to our children. It may be to the person you are mentoring or discipling. We need to be reminded that passing on our faith is of highest importance. It is of supreme and eternal value. It is more important than passing on your wealth to the next generation. It's more important than just simply passing on the uh, a good sounding name, okay? a name that, that uh, society recognizes. What is more important is you pass on the faith and help the next generation walk according to that faith. And so for us to pass our faith to the next generation, remember, first of all, we ourselves, we have to be rightly connected with God before anything else. Because you cannot pass on what you do not possess 
yourself. Then secondly, remember, invest time in the next generation, both quality and quantity time. Because when we have these quality and quantity time, then we can effectively teach them. And then finally, be careful and persistent when you teach the next generation. We do this by being patient with them until they understand the lesson. And we are careful also by obeying the commands of the Lord. There's a saying that goes, more is caught than is taught. And that is true. Our children or our disciples, they will see what we are doing and they will imitate us. Therefore, let us be diligent in teaching and modeling the Christ-like life. And so the challenge this morning is, are you ready to disciple the next generation? Are you ready to disciple your children for the Lord Jesus? My hope and prayer for all of us is that we will realize the importance and the urgency of this task that the Lord has given to us. If you are already a follower of Jesus Christ, then you must take it to the next step. And that is, you must take on the responsibility to teach your children, to teach the next generation to follow Christ. Now, if you are here this morning and if you don't have a relationship with Christ, then I encourage you to put your trust in Him, to believe in Him, to believe in the Gospel. Later on, if you have inquiries, you can approach our pastors and our leaders about how we can have that relationship with Jesus Christ. Because you can only begin discipling others if you are already in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So I hope that all of us, we will be up to the challenge to disciple the next generation for Him. Let's not lose the next generation. Instead, let us preserve the legacy of faith from this generation to the next and to the next and to the next. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today's passage. Thank you because it reminds us that we must be careful that we must pass on the faith to the next generation. Lord, we pray that you will continue to help us and equip us that, Lord, we can invest our lives, our time, that we can model out and we can properly teach the next generation about following Jesus Christ, about living a life of surrender to Him. Lord, we know that this is an enormous task, and so we ask for the grace to be able to do that, Lord. Father, we pray that in the next weeks, may you continue to teach us more about the family and why it is so important to you. We pray this in Jesus' name.